We've arrived in Puerto Rico, a US island territory more than $70 billion in debt. Residents are American citizens, but the poverty rate here is three times the national average. Now, with the economy facing collapse, record numbers are using their American passports to get out. I have never been away from home. Like, this is the first time that I'm gonna be away from a long time. Why did he choose to go? He wanted to go. Mm. So the family is incredibly sad. The son is going away for the very first time. He's just 21 years old. He's got a job in Orlando, Florida, and he just thought it was a better opportunity. And he's taking a flight right now. Yeah, I mean, all friends are, are living. Like, a lot of people that I know, that I talk to, yeah, I'm leaving soon and maybe will not come back. So they're like, yeah, I want to do that too because it'll be better and, like, life there. I don't know, the economy, exactly. It's like, it'll be better where they are. Does it make you sad to leave Puerto Rico? Yeah, this, this is my home, my family, my friends. More Puerto Ricans are leaving now than at any time since the 1950s. As this historic exodus unfolds, fault lines came to find out what the future holds for the island they've left behind. We have a good country here. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. As Puerto Rico's crisis deepens, the government is slashing public spending. One of the sectors that's been hardest hit, education. Yes, in the past two years, the government has shut down 135 schools. Mercedes Martinez is president of the Teachers' Federation. They've been trying to fight the school closures, but the government is now planning hundreds more. Well, it's definitely a response from the government and an attack towards the working class and the... An attack on the working class? Yes, definitely. Why That's... on the working class? I mean, are the schools in areas where... Yes, all of the schools that have been shut down have been in areas of impoverished communities. We're on our way to the Jose Melendez Ayala School, which was closed just before the school year began. But the community has refused to leave until the Secretary of Education pays them a visit. So this, this is the school? Yeah, this is the school. And these people, so this is mainly parents? These are parents, teachers, that are waiting for us to get here. When police arrived to clear the school out, the community made a stand. They've been camped outside for three months welding the front gates shut so no one can get in. Hola. They still hold the keys to the back entrance okay. with help from a neighboring church. It's a nice school. Myra Tapia taught here for decades. So this was your classroom. We can go inside? Oh, it's still open. Her old classroom is on the other side of this door. This is the first time you've so been working. up here since it closed. Sí. Must be a big change for you. Sí, me extraño mucho. Se me ha hecho difícil, pero estoy en una comunidad buena y una facultad muy buena. Pero se me ha hecho difícil. Fueron casi 25 años viniendo aquí, asistiendo aquí. Pero yo espero que el secretario reconsidere. Tengo, me queda algo de fe todavía. Have you seen inside since then? You haven't seen. I'm just waiting. Uh -huh. Porque están mis cosas ahí. Yo tuve que entregar la llave. Tuve que entregar la llave. It must be really sad. The 
the school's former students here have been relocated to bigger schools further away. But each day after class, many return to this one. Including one of Myra's former students, Tanisha. Yeah, it's everything's here. Everyone's know each other. And it's all so <laughs> familiar. Like. So now you've been uh, part of this, this campaign. The fight keeps on and they go on and still here. It's 91 days. Yeah, 91 days is a lot. Con los niños uno no debe cortar por ahí, no es por ahí donde uno va a cortar. Porque la educación de un pueblo marca un pueblo, es el éxito del pueblo. Y eso lástimo. Okay, everybody. One, two, three. The Puerto Rican education system has been targeted before. In 2008, teachers led an island-wide strike. Three years later, university students clashed with police over fee hikes. Manuel Natal was a leader of those protests and is now the youngest member of Congress. He has opposed a plan released by the governor designed to repay creditors on Wall Street. The plan calls for even more cuts to public education. Every day we're being told, no, you know what, there is no alternative. Uh, we're going to increase taxes on the poor. I'm sorry, there is no alternative. We're going to reduce uh, spending on, on education. Sorry, there is no alternative. We're going to limit the services of our public transportation. Sorry, there is no alternative. And, and they're trying to force us into one course of action. And, and some of us are challenging that. And we're presenting alternatives. And when we present alternatives, is no, I'm sorry, that can't be done. A decade of economic hardship and the prospect of more cuts has left many Puerto Ricans with no other option but to leave. I think most Puerto Ricans have already made so many sacrifices in order to survive uh, within this crisis that at this point uh, everyone has, has literally gone to, to the bare minimum. We have faced uh, in the last couple of years a, a, a massive exodus, particularly of the youngest and most productive citizens here in Puerto Rico. And I hate using the word leaving because no one is deciding to leave. Everyone is being pushed out of the island and, and there's not, it's not an option staying. Not everyone is fleeing Puerto Rico's economic collapse. As many Puerto Ricans are pushed out, a new group is arriving. Struggling to pay its debts and revive the economy, Puerto Rico is trying to attract Wall Street investors by offering some of the lowest tax rates in the world. As a result, investors like Nick Prouty are moving in. You know, we have six or seven hundred people who've moved to Puerto Rico. You have great wealth that has, uh, that has been attracted to Puerto Rico. The island is already among the most unequal economies in the United States. Now, there's an influx of extreme wealth. These, this, this, uh, this is the Ritz Reserve, the only six-star hotel uh, in, in Puerto Rico. I think one of the it's few. It's a six-star hotel. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're super luxe, I guess. These are all six to $10 million houses all along here. So it's this bizarre contrast in Puerto Rico at the moment of you know, very intense economic dislocation, and yet at the same time, the influx of some very significantly wealthy investors. Um, and that can certainly lead to uh, all sorts of resentment. Prouty relocated his private equity firm from Connecticut two years ago. Today, he's flying us to his most recent purchase, a marina on the island's east coast. There, there, now we're coming up upon Puerto del Rey right in front of us. Here's, this is your investment. Yes, here's here. the, this is the largest marina in the Caribbean. It's initially, this is a nine-figure investment. Prouty says investors like him are creating jobs and stimulating the economy. 
Hola, todo bien? Pero me alegro. He's keen for more investors to follow his lead. And once you do the research, it's, it, the, the, it becomes such a compelling business case. You couple that with a government that's bending over backwards to attract capital and bring people back to the island, both the Puerto Rican diaspora that have moved away, as well as people who would have not necessarily moved here were it not for the incentives. Right. And you couple all that together and you've got something that's really interesting and really compelling. Let's go down and grab a drink. Yeah. The government has developed an ad campaign for what they call some of the most favorable tax conditions in the world. I think what investors need to realize, and it's pretty amazing, is how Puerto Rico has worked to create a special combination of factors that make it unique. Its incentives, yes, but its lifestyle, its government support, it's the talent of the people. It's a true business forward community. And you can't beat that. This uh, little video, I, I think it's probably geared towards uh, uh, promoting some of the legislation that the Puerto Rico government adopted not long ago. It's called Law Number 20 and Law Number 22. We met up with Rafael Bernabe, a former candidate for governor with the Working People's Party. It's basically a tax-free environment. They're telling them, if you, if you pay taxes in the United States, you are contributing to the public uh, funds in the United States. Well, move to Puerto Rico. You don't have to pay. He says the strategy is starving the island of much-needed revenue, leading the economy further into debt. 4% corporate tax rate. 100% mm -hmm. exemption on all dividends and interest income. 100% exemption on all capital gain. So as, as I tell you, it's, that's a pretty it's, good deal. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. And uh, the, the, uh, that it, it is a good deal for them, there's no question. The question is whether it's a good deal for Puerto Rico and, it's a, it, or, and it, does it generate any economic development. The incentives have attracted some of Wall Street's wealthiest. So this is our main lobby bar. It's called the Vanderbilt Court. This is Fahad Ghaffar, a partner at Paulson & Company, a hedge fund that has purchased this five-star hotel and several others. And that's our other hotel, La Concha. Oh, wow. Okay. With a beautiful restaurant right on, right on the beach. There's a big ocean right over there. That's yours too? Yeah. Wow. And if you go through this gate, you walk right through the park and you end up at a humongous beach, which is in front of La Concha, but there's a setup over there for Vanderbilt guests okay. and their butler, and they have their butler service right on the they beach. They have a butler service on the beach? Yeah, on the beach. That's our spa, 6,000 square feet, 5,000 square foot gym. It's got the only hammam in all of Puerto Rico. Oh, really? Yeah. So this is the tower? This is the sweet tower, correct. Wow, great view. So here you can get a great perspective of the whole property. That's the infinity pool in the corner. And then we have some other development lots down Thank the street goodness. over there. You, you buy up a lot of this property. <laughs> well, we, we, we found some good opportunities at depressed prices. Back at the marina, we asked Nick Prouty how his plans fit with the economic recovery. Sounds like it. But I mean, for, for those that say, you, you know, this type of development isn't what the country needs. It's not going to help, you know, those... It's a thousand the jobs. It's a thousand jobs up and down the value chain. It's too easy just to say, OK, well, look at this group coming in with their Bentleys and living in their gated communities. It's too easy. It's too easy a story to tell. There is an element of truth to that. No denying that. But that group eventually will begin to make investments in Puerto Rico, and those investments will spark the economic recovery. The rationale behind that is that uh, U.S. or for external investments in Puerto Rico will generate employment, will generate economic growth, will generate in an indirect way government revenue. That policy has ceased functioning, very evidently. It's not generating employment, it's not generating economic growth, it's not generating higher uh, government revenue. Uh, and uh, uh, what you have now is an economy which creates a tremendous amount of profits. It's about $35 billion a year that leave the island in profits. This is Nick Prouty. The first time he wanted to meet uh, John Paulson, the, even though they are from New Jersey and never met, 
Here, in the office of Puerto Rico's Secretary of Economic Development, pictures of Wall Street investors line the walls. And we are attracting successful, proven billionaires uh, on the top 100 list of investors in the United States and probably in the top 200 investors of the world. This is one of the most unequal places in the entire United States. The gap between rich and poor is wider here than it is anywhere else. Uh, that's Bringing that's in true. hedge fund billionaires and having, you know, five-star, six-star hotels opening up for those investors to come in and stay while they look for places, properties to buy so that they can take advantage of those tax incentive laws. I mean, isn't that going to just simply exacerbate the inequality that already exists and is such a problem? But the reality is that each one of these people that have moved on their low 2022 have created three, four jobs, are using our engineers, are using our architects, are using our policy uh, companies, are buying the properties, are, are going to our restaurants, uh, are using helicopter services, uh, uh, the, the pilots are, are very happy, are using uh, catering for the jets, uh, are creating economic activity that are giving job to people, are giving work. Uh, uh, and it's something that you had zero and you have nothing to lose. Uh, uh, they are adding up. The fact that some people want to criticize is because they are born that way. They are born losers. Uh, they have never been able to succeed. Maybe a millionaire will move to Puerto Rico. Maybe will, he will employ, you know, 10, 15 people to attend his very big uh, mansion. Maybe he will spend some money in restaurants and so on, generate a few jobs that way. You know, but that is not going to bring the Puerto Rican economy out of its, uh, of its crisis. Puerto Rico's diaspora in the U.S. is 5 million strong and growing every day. But those who've left are well-placed to have an impact on the island's future. Para hacer algo muy simple, hablar con estos buitres de Blue Mountain para ver cuál es el interés de ellos en nuestra isla de Puerto Rico, donde nació mi papá, donde nació mi mamá. These Puerto Rican activists have arrived on the doorstep of a Manhattan-based hedge fund, Blue Mountain Capital. El pueblo sufre, sufre. Hedge funds often invest in debt-ridden economies buying up bonds at low prices and looking to flip them for quick profits. And Puerto Rico is their latest target. The strategy has earned them a reputation among critics as so-called vulture funds. Están diciendo cortar los maestros de las escuelas. Están diciendo bajar el salario mínimo que ahora mismo solamente está a 7 25. Están diciendo, si tienen día de enfermedad pagado, quítale eso. Todos los beneficios de los trabajadores, quítale eso. Porque el único interés que tiene es ganarse más poder y ganarse más dinero a la vez de cuidar a las personas, a los humanos, a los boricuas, a group of hedge funds that own Puerto Rican debt hired Claudio Losser to find ways for Puerto Rico to solve its debt crisis. Among the former IMF economists' recommendations, even more cuts to education. But, but it shows the expenditure and school enrollment, how it has declined school enrollment and how education expenditure has increased enormously. We have been very careful to say that we believe that this is a decision that has to be taken by the authorities of the island. Education is too important to be played with and uh, be cut in an irrational or discretionary fashion. Well, your co-author briefed reporters that Puerto Rico is massively overspending on education. I mean, that, that, that was the message that, that, that is, came out from I the mean, report. This is true. People, I mean, this is for the government to, to decide. I mean, they're obviously, they are, if you look at the, at, at the expenditure in, 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 in education, it is high. 
Do you also need to close schools? I mean, the government has closed uh, around 100 already the, the, this the, year so far. I, I mean, that's, I mean, is that something that the you think is helpful? The, the, I, I don't want to get too much into this. I'm not an expert on education. What is essential is that they were living beyond their means. I mean, this is something that happens to us. Of course, it's difficult for anybody to cut. It's difficult to live within one's means. The report argues that with these cuts, Puerto Rico should be able to repay its Wall Street creditors. I mean, they have profit motives, like most of us do in this society. Well, they're hedge funds. And they're hedge funds, and well, they, well you, you want to... I mean, do they have any other motivations? Do, uh, they, do they have any other motivations should, other, should, other no, than my profit? Question, I answer uh, culturally with the question, should they have another motivation as a business proposition? Because what do you think? I don't think so. The Puerto Rican governor's office criticized the hedge fund report as, quote, an extreme form of austerity. But a similar government plan for public education is already in motion. It's a plan that's left Tanisha and her mother Jackie camped out in front of their school. I used to have this, this art teacher that it was very special because I draw it and we draw it like she showed me how to draw. And that's when I started that very important for me. And that started at the school? Yeah, that started there. That's when I realized that I can draw and maybe I can do better things and do better stuff. Can you understand why they would need to take these kinds of measures? No es que no consoliden, es como lo hacen. Y sé que así han cerrado muchas excelentes escuelas, donde los estudiantes académicamente salen muy bien. Our school represents that mistake for the whole country and the people who see it and realize that it's, it wasn't a good decision. Do you ever get congressmen or politicians coming, coming here and seeing the situation? Cuando hay elecciones, cuando hay elecciones, <laughs> todos vienen, sí, todos vienen y oh, te vamos a ayudar, o oh, vamos a hacer esto para la comunidad, pero de momento votaste por ellos y no aparecen. Ya no hay ayudas, no. Government officials have refused to visit the encampment. We are making a change, trying to make a change. And we were there and everyone like united. It was very good. Maybe we didn't make it, but we tried. And that's what counts. We tried and we tried a lot and did a lot of stuff to, to open it, but they didn't came. Still, after 130 days, the families remained outside their school, calling for it to be reopened.